A Senate committee fishes for advice from a local legend, and young adults could have a cocktail with their parents. These issues are detailed in this week's Capitol Report. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's Capitol Report. I'm Julie Barkey. Hundreds of outdoorsmen were lured to the Capitol on Wednesday, promoting hunting and fishing as an important way of life in Minnesota. They come to show support for legislation that improves Minnesota's waters and wildlife. This session, a proposed fee increase on hunting and fishing licenses, has heightened awareness of preservation. Senator Bill Ingerbretson is here to talk about his proposal. Thank you for joining nice us. Nice to be here. Nice to be here. Senator, let's begin with the hunting and fishing licenses. Fee increases are proposed. First time, as I mentioned, since 2001. Now, you stated last that last session there wasn't much of an appetite in the legislature at that time to move forward with any fee increases. Why now? Well, well, I think last year, of course, with the $5.2 billion deficit to come in and raise anything on anybody was just not going to be part of the plan. So uh, I knew enough, well enough that, uh, and I think the DNR did as well, to uh, uh, just throw it out there, th throw the need out there. The uh, Legislative Oversight Committee, of course, has, uh, was put in place some years ago to, uh, to oversee this, and uh, it's their recommendation, their very strong recommendation, that we do something real, real serious. Uh, real seriously this year because they actually are going to be that particular fund is going to be in the red in 2014 even maybe even in 2013 later later on so uh, I said that I would carry that uh, legislation and uh, we're here today to uh, uh, to move it forward and let's talk a little bit about those fee increases mm -hmm. and the revenue they could bring in and is it enough yes uh, the, the governor's proposal uh, the DNR proposal is about 14 million dollars uh, which is uh, uh, we thought was a little bit of an overreach, so uh, the bill that I have actually is, is bringing it up uh, just, just shy of that, and, and uh, that will bring it out to about year 2018 or 2020 right in there before it have to be looked at again. So, but uh, with, with the cost of living and with, uh, with uh, you know, staying with the times, 11 years without a fee increase is, uh, uh, some people say, <clears throat> somewhat irresponsible. I, I, I don't know that I would say it's irresponsible because I think that's how it's been done in the past. <clears throat> but uh, nevertheless, uh, um, it's going to bring in the needed dollars, and especially now when we're talking about the uh, AIS situ situation that we have, and of course these dollars go to the conservation officers, the enforcement actions, and all their equipment, and uh, uh, it would be very... Uh, and by AIS, I just want to interject, yeah, aquatic invasive aquatic species. Aquatic invasive species of all types, you know, from the zebra <laughs> mussels, quagga mussels, to the, uh, the new uh, uh, invasive carp that's coming up the river. So. Uh, it would be uh, certainly prudent to make sure that we keep our complement up of enforcement officers that are going to be helping out with the, uh, the station enforcement that we're going to be doing uh, for invasive species. So. As the bill stands, these fees are roughly about $5 for, say, hunting and fishing, et cetera. Is this going to bring in enough money, do you think? Well, yes. It's, it's, you know, the DNR is saying it's going to bring in enough. The bill that I have, again, will, will bring us out to those, that particular you know, time, uh, you know, 2019. The governor's proposal, I'm guessing, would bring us out to the 2000 and. Uh, 21 to 22 area, but the legislature at that point can, in time can can uh, deal with it. Now that's that's my proposal. The House proposal, I'm hearing, is actually coming in with the governor's governor's numbers. So, as things happen around here, we'll end up in a conference committee. We'll we'll, we'll end up compromising there and and hopefully moving forward. Uh, I just hope people understand and people need to understand that this is a fee. This is something that if you want to hunt and fish, you pay for. Uh, they came to us, the hunting and fishing groups in the state of Minnesota, actually come down here and they want their fees raised. And uh, now, not everybody in the state agrees with that, but nevertheless, the majority of them hunting, uh, you know, the deer hunters, for, for, for instance, are 500,000 strong. Uh, those folks are emailing us now and, and sending letters and, and saying, we, we need our fees uh, to be increased to take care of the cost of running operations. And so given that, do you expect there to be really any controversy with moving this through the process? You know, I don't think so. In the Senate, I'm not, I'm not looking for a lot of controversy. I'm hearing some, some pushback from the House. But I think at the end of the day, they're going to, once they realize again that, that uh, this is not a tax, it is a fee, it is something that, if, again, you don't have to pay, it's, it's optional. And that's what fees are all about. User fees are about having the opportunity to use something in our precious resources. Uh, have to be taken care of and uh, in order to stock fish, in order to uh, you know keep the uh, WMAs and the SNAs uh, uh, up up to, to the standard that, that, that Minnesotans ex expect, it costs money. Is there any concern with you that 
Minnesotans will say, well, forget it. We don't have that extra dollar amount. Not right now anyway, so let's not renew. Let's not get a, a hunting license or a fishing license. That's, certain, that's certainly a possibility. And with the times the way they are, and certainly last year that would have been, you know, a little tougher. But this year we're looking at a little bit, you know, the economy is starting to show us that we're, we're rebounding here in Minnesota. The jobs are, are starting to grow. We're, we're looking at uh, uh, some excess dollars. That certainly has not hurt this program. It certainly hurts the or helps the idea moving forward when we're becoming a little more solvent. Our, our reserves and our cash flow is starting to build up. So I think people are becoming a little more comfortable with the, with the economy right now. So I think it's a pretty good time. What's next for the bill? Actually, next uh, uh, two days from now, which will be Friday, uh, I'll be bringing it to the Finance Committee and from there directly to the floor. Okay, we'll follow that. All Thank right, you for joining good. us, Senator. Thank we you appreciate very much. it. Thanks for having me. The proposal to increase hunting and fishing licenses was vetted and passed by the Senate Environment and Natural Resources Committee. The issue lured an outdoor heavy hitter. After looking at it, uh, it was a no-brainer. I mean, I just couldn't understand why anybody would be opposed to a, a raise in the fishing and hunting licenses uh, when it's been since 2001, I think, since they've had a, a increase. Well, inflation and everything else, gasoline and all the other uh, expenses that you have in fishing and hunting have all gone up except the licenses. Uh, a fishing or hunting license is the biggest bargain the state has to offer its citizens. I mean, it's uh, hard to imagine that you can get any other entertainment at that price. I don't care whether you're a, uh, you know, in, in pro sports, amateur sports, or just camping, hunting, fishing, biggest bargain the state offers us. Uh, we've got more opportunities here than any other state that I'm that I frequent. Now some states like South Dakota might have better pheasant hunting but we have pheasant hunting. Some states may have better elk hunting but we don't have that but we got we can match any other state in any other out there activity and our fishing is a second to none in terms of opportunities for all species of fish. The state of Minnesota uh, is a you know 400 miles long state and it covers a lot of different ecosystems and the fishing and the hunting here is the envy of all the other states surrounding us. And you believe this fee increase will help preserve that? I think it will and it, 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 we're in a preservation mode right now. I'd like to see the fee larger so we could increase some of our uh, restorations, let's call it. But remembering that Minnesota has some of the largest federal lands, largest state lands, county lands, timber land that we can hunt on for free. Other states, you've got to have a lease. If you, otherwise, you, don't have, you can't buy a license, no place to hunt. We have free hunting, free fishing, public accesses, uh, rivers, streams, lakes, Great Lakes, three major rivers, St. Croix, Mississippi, Minnesota rivers. We've got everything here. We've got to, if we want to enjoy it, we've got to raise the, the license fee. Licenses for brewery tap rooms, distilleries, wine festivals. The omnibus liquor bill typically contains many elements, and the senator crafting this year's bill joins me now to discuss the different provisions. Senator Chris Gerlach, thanks for joining us on Capitol Report. Glad to be here, Julie. Senator, let's begin with some of the provisions of the bill that you think might impact Minnesotans the most. Uh, well, sure. Well, let me. I should first explain that uh, uh, these provisions are all brought forth by individual members, and as the chairman of the Senate Commerce Committee, I then put them together and we have an omnibus liquor bill. Uh, we make decisions about what should be in the omnibus bill, maybe what would go separately, what should just sort of lay on the cutting room floor, and we put this together Which then. Which is why you're the crafter of well, this. The, yes, <laughs> well, so the omnibus bill generally has um, items that are not with great controversy. Things, these would be items that have been ironed out uh, for the most part. Not complete consensus, but, but pretty much. And uh, we have, a, I mean, there's a number of things uh, on the list. Uh, everything from uh, Senator Julie Rosen has a provision for the city of Winnebago for craft brewers to be able to uh, uh, escape from a, a heavy state licensing fee just because they want to bring in some craft brew, uh, craft beer from another state uh, for a one day or a weekend long event. And so we, we're, you know, carving out a little exemption to make that happen, those types of things. Um, Senator John Howe from Red Wing has a couple of different ones dealing with uh, wine, 
One of them has to do with our Minnesota farm wineries being able to uh, use uh, uh, bulk wine from other states in a small amounts to be able when, when the uh, grape crop isn't as good as it, it uh, should have been and to, to sort of even out their business. Um, he has also one for uh, wine festivals. Now last year we passed a wine festival uh, provision of his and uh, we did not allow for any uh, people to take uh, off sale, meaning to take a bottle of wine home with them. So this year what we did is uh, we added a provision of his that uh, would allow people to uh, attend the, the annual wine festival and then be able to take up to a maximum of six bottles home with them. So there's uh, those types of things uh, are things we've done. There, and there are others. And Senator, you're saying that this typically is not a controversial bill. So what are some of the items that perhaps were a bit too controversial that were taken out and taken up sure. as separate provisions? Let me, let me also, also say that it's uh, sometimes it can be controversial. Yeah, there have been times. I've certainly. tried to decide if something should go separately or, or not. And uh, there are probably a couple of controversial ones that were not included. Uh, one of them dealt with what's called primary source, and that has to do with uh, wholesalers and with spirits, distilled spirits. Um, uh, and uh, it was a, really it was a business versus business dispute. Um, it was a, a bill we gave a hearing to, and we heard the issues. Initially, I had uh, included it in the bill, but there was a motion in committee to remove it, and uh, that prevailed, so we took that out. Now, will it be uh, offered up on the floor as an amendment? It's possible, and we'll debate it on the floor. Uh, but uh, that's an example of, of one that was not included. Uh, also, uh, the Minnesota Grocers Association uh, were promoting a, uh, a bill to allow for multiple licenses for a single owner. Current law is, if you're within a city, you can't own more than one liquor store as a single owner. And the idea was to prevent monopoly control and uh, of, a, of a highly regulated industry being liquor, and uh, to, to diffuse that. Well, of course, grocery stores, uh, among other you know, drug stores and such, can have a separate liquor store, and they um, want to have be able to do multiple uh, locations. And it's very controversial if you're a mom and pop liquor store <laughs> that can 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 really uh, change the game, so to speak. Uh, that was not included, and an amendment was not offered up in committee, so, so that's uh, there. But those are a couple of examples of some more controversial ones that were not included. You did give Senator Sandy Pop Pappas a hearing on her bill, which allows 18 to 21-year-olds right. to have a cocktail if they're out to dinner with their parents. What do you think of this provision? You know, at, at first, my first initial thought was, Absolutely not. We can't do something like that. Uh, it'll affect federal highway funds, and and uh, this is this is not something we would do. But uh, you know what? She she made a case uh, for it, and the committee decided that what we would do is send it on to the transportation committee to take a look at. Uh, so I did not include it in the omnibus bill. Um, we did vote it out of committee, and uh, then on the floor, actually, she had dis discussed this with the transportation chair, and he said that uh, it had been altered and such and wouldn't affect transportation funding, and so it was then uh, sent off to the Judiciary Committee. So there it is right now, and uh, I don't know what her plans would be about, uh, you know, what the committee might do it there, or if she had plans to offer it as an amendment. And it's, it's a very intriguing issue that uh, I think, uh, you know, it'll probably end up as a floor vote at some point. Yeah, so let's pontificate a bit. If okay. it doesn't make it out in time to meet the committee mm -hmm. deadlines, and she does opt to actually introduce this as an amendment into the omnibus bill, would you support it? Uh, me personally, honestly, I really don't know right now. Uh, I voted it out of committee. My personal vote was to, to vote for it just because I thought it was an interesting enough to, uh, to have some legs to move on to some other committees and, and get a further hearing on it. Uh, if it came to a final vote on the floor, I honestly don't know. I, I'd have to look at it a lot more closely. And we're just about out of time, but I did want to ask you, are there any surprises for you this session concerning this bill, either issues that didn't come up or that did and you weren't expecting them you to. Know, I, I would have thought that there would have been more of a push by the University of Minnesota on the uh, TCF stadium to uh, you know the ongoing dispute about whether the regents should decide if liquor is, is uh, an option there um, but that issue never came up from anywhere that was a bit of a surprise I thought there would have been more of an initiative to, to do that. What about Sunday liquor sales? Um, Sunday liquor was one we passed out of the committee uh, last year uh, it's it's uh, uh, the you know it's entirely in the author's hands Senator Roger Reiner from Duluth being a border legislator on the border, uh, they tend to be more interested in the Sunday sales issue, uh, but uh, he has not uh, brought that up. I believe it's in the Finance Committee, and I don't know that he's actually pursued that. Um, so 
I don't know. Okay. Well, Senator Chris Gerlach, we're out of time. Thank you for uh, talking a little bit about the bill today. We appreciate right. it. Thank you. Providing a photo identification prior to voting continues to move through the legislature. The proposal is a constitutional amendment asking Minnesota voters to decide if a photo ID must be presented to cast a ballot. As expected, the issue brought hours of debate on the House floor Tuesday night. Without question, we have a very strong constitutional amendment that protects our access, increases integrity, and makes sure that every eligible voter will be able to vote. Some have said, well, what about disenfranchisement? Well, I want you to know that in those court cases, not one single case a voter disenfranchisement was documented before any of those courts, not one. But the court did recognize that fraud does occur and the honesty of legitimate voters can be undermined by having those who are not eligible casting their ballots. Let's leave the merits aside for a minute because I know everyone here has made up their mind on the merits. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? Let me talk in ways that I think everyone in here as an elected official can understand. What you are doing when you vote green today is you are starting an arms race that I think you will regret. Because now the standard is if you feel passionately about an issue, if your base loves it, and if it polls well, forget the legislative process. Go over the heads of a governor and just slap it onto the Constitution. That's the new standard. And I fear, I really do not cheer, this is not a threat, it's not a promise, I will be sickened if this happens, but I really fear that what's going to happen now is there will be, of course, some sort of retaliatory impulse. And two can play at this game. So there will be no incentive among supporters of Democrats for any restraint or self-discipline when it comes to constitutional amendments, just as Republicans today are showing no restraint, no self-discipline. And so if there's a popular issue that plays well in certain political circles and that the public seems to like based on public opinion polls, why not go for it? Why not just slap it into the Constitution, write in permanent ink, make it forever, and impose our will on future generations? Senator Sandy Pappas has a bill that would allow 18 to 21 year olds to have a glass of wine or a beer when they're out to dinner with their parents. She's here to discuss this provision. Senator, thank you for joining us today. You're welcome. First of all, what was the impetus behind this legislation? Actually, um, uh, Representative Phyllis, Phyllis Kahn and I have always commented that we, uh, that we kind of prefer the European approach, or there's actually 12 other states that allow uh, older teenagers, 18, 19, 20 year olds, to have a glass of wine when they're out with their parents. And um, so she brought it to me this year and we've done various liquor bills together, 2 a.m. closings, et cetera. So I agreed to try it and I was actually surprised when I got a hearing. <laughs> You did get a hearing on it. I got it. a hearing on it, right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the concerns that came have come up because of it. One would be Senator Warren Limmer stating that essentially it's underage drinking. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with this? Well, what is the legal age? I mean, at 18, you can get married. You can take out loans that, that place you in huge debt. You can buy a house. You can adopt a child. You can get married. You can sign documents. You can vote. You can join the military. So you just can't drink. Um, you can't legally drink. And this is a very modest approach because we actually um, amended the bill to scale it back to just the provision where if you're with your parents or you're with your legal guardian or if you're with a spouse that's legal, what if you're 20 and you're married to someone who's 25 and they want to take you out for a Valentine's dinner and you can't have a glass of wine? So um, we think it was a really modest approach. Kind of working off of that theory, you know, I'm a parent and my son has his father's last name. So mm -hmm. how do you envision the enforcement of this so that you know that that person is indeed with a family member who's oh, that's legal? very interesting. I never thought of that. <laughs> uh, I think that the, the server would just say, you know, are you the parent? And they'd say yes. And that would probably be the end of it. I don't know that they would ask you to prove documentation or something. So you wouldn't have to pull out your birth certificate <laughs> right. or anything. Yeah. Okay. And I, I did want to ask, why beer and wine? Why not allow for spirits as well? Oh, spirits are allowed. Oh, they are? Yeah. 
Well, there we go. So I yeah. got you got one on me. I got one on right. you. It wasn't even intentional. Yeah. So I want to talk to you real quickly now. Um, so at this point, the bill has been pulled from committee. Um, it passed out of committee and it was sent to transportation and the transportation chair agreed that it didn't have an impact on federal funding, which was the concern uh, because the alcohol is still considered in the possession of the parents. So that's how 12, 14 other states are able to do this legally and not lose federal funds. But when I pulled it to the floor, I had a motion, um, Senator Limmer offered a higher motion to pull it into a judiciary committee. And that, that actually kills it for the year because then we don't meet the deadline. Okay, and given that, you still have some options available, such as offering it well, as an amendment. I could offer it as an amendment. And the reason why I may consider doing that is because the more serious side of this, it's not just being able to have a drink with your parents, it's also the issue of binge drinking. That over 150 college presidents have signed a letter saying that we should lower the drinking age, because it's not, it's not enforceable. And we encourage students to binge drink, to pregame, it's called, where they drink a lot of alcohol before they go out, so it lasts them during the evening, since they can't legally drink, they illegally drink. And it doesn't really teach them moderation. So if they're allowed to go out and legally drink um, in a public setting, they learn moderate drinking, and they don't feel like they're deprived, and they have to go underground with it. And we have a huge problem with underground drinking. What do you think the support is? Have you gauged it yet? Um, I was surprised in committee how many people thought that it was very reasonable. Um, and it just may be that maybe in families they have a tradition at Thanksgiving or at Passover, like in my family, that you know young people can have a half a glass of wine um, to just try it out. You know, and that it's, it's not seen as that big a deal to most parents. Okay, and a, broad, a more broad topic, what is your overall impression of the Omnibus Liquor Bill as it currently stands? Well, as it currently stands, it's pretty non-controversial, and that's been the tradition with the Omnibus Liquor Bill, is that you keep the more controversial things, like my provision, um, as standalone bills. So the most controver controversial uh, provision was pulled out, and that's called primary source and that is to require that alcohol, like current law, requires wine and beer, retailers can only purchase that from the manufacturer directly. So there is a market that, where they can get uh, less expensive alcohol, but there's a concern about it being um, altered or adulterated in some way. I'm just about out of time, but I did mm -hmm. want to ask, do you think you might add your provision as an amendment to the liquor bill? Um, well, you're kind of making me, encouraging me. <laughs> Just asking your You're thoughts. Making it at sound this like time. an interesting idea, and um, I'm strongly considering it. Okay. But the other provisions in the liquor bill really have to do with loosening the laws around wine, and I support that too. Okay. Well, if you add your provision to it on the floor, I'm sure we'll have some uh, heated debate on the issue. Right. So, Senator Pappas, thank you for joining us right. today. Thanks for having me. Senator Al DeCryfe is one of a handful of Senate Republicans stepping away from public office. We sat down with him to get an inside perspective of his time in the Senate. The announcement that you would not seek re-election came less than two weeks after the new district maps were released. How much of a factor did that play in your decision? Well, I was ready to go. I was anticipating running again, and uh, when the redistricting maps came out, uh, they weren't exceptionally kind to me. Uh, they left me with about 5% of my constituents. So, and as well as that, they paired me with another seated senator. Uh, senator Rosen uh, is a 10-year senator, and she's chair of the Energy Committee, and I just decided that, uh, that I would not seek re-election with her. I think part of being a team player is, uh, is uh, there's, there's times when it's right to run, and there's times that it is not right. And uh, what I'd like to do is spend a little time getting to know some of the people in that district. And if Senator Rosen ever decides not to run, um, uh, that I might be considered at that time. What would you place as your greatest legislative accomplishment in your two years in the Senate? Well, we're still working on it. <laughs> we have, uh, I have a piece of legislation that's in the Education Committee. It's called Innovation in the Schools. And what we are trying to do is get some pilot projects going throughout the state that would lift all of the state mandates. If there's some things that, that, uh, that, that people talk about in the schools, it's all the regulations that we place on them as government. Now there's federal regulations and there's state regulations. And what we're suggesting with this legislation is if we can, um, if you can work together as a group of schools, put forward your plan on how you think you could best educate kids 
and then the commissioner would have to approve this plan. Um, I'll just give you an example. In my family, I have a son who's 32 years old who has special needs. Uh, Jason was born with cerebral palsy, and uh, he's in a wheelchair, but he came through the special ed program. I have some of his teachers coming back to me and telling me that they're spending 75% of their time doing paperwork rather than spending time with the kids, and they're asking me for help. So what I'm suggesting is let's take the state regulations and let's let the special ed teachers try to put forward the paperwork that they think is actually necessary. And the rest of it, let's, let's try for, for the, this four-year program. It's fair to say that the last year, year and a half, have been um, challenging in the Senate. A lot of different dynamics between the state government shutdown, special session, et cetera. What would you say was the most challenging part for you? Julie, I would have to say that um, there was a time that the governor made a comment. And his comment was he ran into a group of freshman legislators that, aren't, that don't understand how government works and they're not interested in learning. And I thought about that for a while. And at first I thought, he's right. I think the governor was right. Because what he ran into is a group of business people. Julie, in my business life, what I've done is I've had to make decisions so big that in my life, if I make them wrong, I not only lose my business, but I lose my home and I put my family on the street. I'm used to making big decisions, and other business people are as well. The governor lives in a different world than I do. I don't know how to live my life that if I had made a million dollar blunder one day, I would say, oh well, I just have another check coming in next month. It's not a big deal. I don't know how to live my life that way. Every dollar, when you earn your money yourself, you look at the world differently. And my wife and I know how to live poor. Now we've come out of living in poverty to having something in the world because we've worked hard for it. The governor doesn't know how to think like I do. And quite frankly, I don't know how to think like the governor does. So we do come from two different places. So that's been the biggest challenge to me, is trying to understand where the governor's coming from when he wants to arbitrarily raise taxes on the rich, when those people are mobile. I know some wealthy people, and they have accountants, they have businesses, and they can move. If you and I were to sit here, and we were to say every person right here that had blonde hair is gonna pay double the cost in, uh, in taxes next year, you would go, uh-uh, we're not gonna do that, I'm gonna leave, because you could. So, you can't pick on a, on a certain segment. If you raise taxes on everyone, no one would complain. Well, there would be people complaining, but you can't pick out a certain segment, especially a segment that's mobile, and think you're gonna raise taxes on them and have them sit by and just pay them, because they can leave. Okay, Senator Al DeCry, thanks for providing your perspective today. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you, Julie. That wraps up this week's program. From all of us at Senate Media and House Public Information Services, I'm Julie Barkey. Thank you for watching Capitol Report.